guys, welcome back. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports and WeBuyGuns.com in Westfield, Indiana, and you are watching Marksman TV. Today on the table, I have a series of 1903 pattern rifles. More specifically, I have a Springfield 1903, a Remington 1903A3, and a couple Remington 1903A4 rifles. Now, there's some obvious differences between these rifles, which I will aim to discuss in detail in this video, hopefully giving you guys the full historical context and history of this very iconic rifle. So without further ado, if that sounds interesting to you, please stick around, it's coming up now. All right, guys, before jumping into this video, I did want to point this book out to you guys. This is the 03 Springfield Service Rifle by Bruce Canfield. If you own and you want to learn more about your 1903 Springfield, this is a great resource. It talks about different cartouches and stamps, what would be correct for which period. Or if you want to know more about the history of this rifle, this is a very detailed account, very good historical record of the production and changes of the rifle. So definitely worth taking a look at. So first getting into this video, let's talk about the historical context of the 1903 or at least the stepping stones that lead up to it and I believe that begins with the model 1873 trapdoor rifle by Springfield Arsenal. Now prior to the 1873 United States troops are running around in the American Civil War shooting at each other with 58 caliber ball muskets which of course are very slow to reload and leave a lot to be desired in the accuracy department. Now, the United States Ordnance Department is looking around both domestically and abroad at the different development in rifle or small arm technology specifically. One of the biggest advances is self-contained rifle cartridges. Now, you're seeing this come online with things like the 1860 Henry rifle. You have the rolling block uh, actions from Remington. And so the United States Ordnance Department thinks, okay, we need to get on the bandwagon and get into something that does fire a self-contained rifle cartridge. So Springfield would come along and they would come up with the 1873 design. First by taking the old uh, muzzle-loaded rifles and converting them, which was known as the Allen conversion, and then coming out with the sort of proprietary 1873 rifle. It did have a trap door that hinged open from the back. You could load in a single round of ammunition, specifically the 4570 government, close the trap door, pull back the hammer, and fire. It drastically sped up the reload time of the rifle, which drastically increased the amount of ammunition put down range by the infantry. Now this was great except for bolt action uh, rifles or rifles with higher capacity were starting to emerge through the 1880s and the 1890s. Now this would come to a head when the United States would think, okay, we need to move from this design. We Great, we have a self-contained rifle cartridge, but now we need to move into something that has an internal magazine, something that can hold more ammunition within the rifle to speed up reloading times. Now, in the 1890s, the, Amer the United States Ordnance Department would go through a series of trials, which it would settle on the model 1892 Krag Jorgensen rifle. Now, the interesting thing about the Krag Jorgensen is it did have a side loading gate, sort of a door that would open up on the side. You could drop in five rounds of ammunition through the side, close the door, and keep those five rounds of ammunition ready to go. It did have a disconnect, so you could single load the rifle if you wanted to do that. But this drastically increased the capacity of the rifle, which decreased the reload time, again, higher volume of fire. Now this would seem to serve well against its other modern contemporaries, especially a five round capacity bolt action rifle, until we get into the Spanish-American War. Now, in the 1898 Spanish-American War, the United States had been building quite a bit of Krag Jorgensen rifles. They had the model 1892, but by then there were later models of the Krag rifle that were not fully scaled and ready for production. So when the war would begin, the troops would go in with the older 1892 model. Now, again, it was great because it did have a higher capacity. However, there were two major deficiencies in the rifle. Number one is it did not have the dual locking lugs of the Mauser Action. Now, the Spanish were actually using the model 1893 Mauser Action. They did have the Spitzer cartridge, and it was able to use stripper clips. So they could reload the rifle very quickly. It had a much stronger action, so the, the Mauser cartridge that they were using had a higher pressure and muzzle velocity, therefore more accuracy and range. So due to the 
more durable action, the better cartridge, and the faster reloading ability of the Mauser, the um, the uh, the Spanish Model 1893 Mauser drastically outperformed the Krag Jorgensen rifle. An example of this is the Battle of San Juan Hill, where actually 750 Spanish regulars were actually able to fight off 15,000 American troops armed with the Krag Jorgensen rifle. So at the conclusion of the Spanish-American War, the United States military knew something had to change, and one of the best things that they could use as a model for the new rifle would be the Mauser action that they had just gone up against in the Spanish-American War, and that would lead us into the development of this. Okay, now brought in close for you guys is the Springfield 1903, chambered in 30 6 It feeds by a five-round stripper clip into a five-round internal box magazine. Now on the bolt, we do have dual locking lugs, which was the design feature of the Mauser that they had seen on the, in the Spanish-American War. You do have a stripper clip guide, so it can be loaded much faster as well. Your rear sight has a V-notch cut and could be adjusted for both windage and gradual elevation changes could be made with the raising of this ladder sight. So very good, very accurate target sights, not necessarily the best battle sights. You have a Mauser style safety on the rear as well as a magazine disconnect if you wanted a single load. It was a, de a definitive improvement over the Craig Jorgensen design, but a couple things happened first to get here. So a bunch of Craig Jorgensen rifles are still left in inventory at the end of the Spanish-American War. First, the United States Ordnance tried to retrofit those rifles with some improvements, one of the biggest being the Parkhurst attachment. Now, as mentioned, the Craig Jorgensen was loaded from the side via a side-loading gate. Five rounds could be inserted inside, and then it could be closed. Now, there was no provision for a stripper clip, so the Parkhurst attachment added this provision. It was retrofitted onto 500 rifles and tested. Although it could be loaded quicker with the stripper clip now, it still was not reloaded at the precision or the accuracy or the quickness, I should say, of the top loaded Mauser style action. So even though good in concept, it still didn't meet a lot of the other deficiencies of the rifle, including the weaker action with the single lug on the bolt. Uh, they wanted to get away from the 30-40 crag round as something with more lethality, more uh, with better ballistics, something that could reach out with more accuracy and more range. So they would go ahead and commission Springfield to come up with a whole new rifle design. Now in 1900 and 1901, they came out with the 1900 and the 1901 prototypes. Now a couple changes would be made. First, they're gonna look more closely at that Mauser action and make those obvious changes. We're going to have a open receiver top with a stripper clip guide. We're going to do a dual guide lug, uh, dual locking lug, excuse me, on the bolt to make the receiver more durable. Now at the 3040 crag is operating at about 2000 feet per second. They wanted to get up to about 300, uh, 2300 feet per second on a new cartridge, which would put the receiver needs in excess of about 40,000 PSI. So they needed a whole new action, which they would come up, up with on the new 1900 and 1901 prototype. Now the prototype rifles had a longer magazine coming down. One of the revisions they wanted to make is to keep the rifle more slim and a more narrow profile. They would want to get rid of that and go to an internal box magazine, which they would do here. Now the first cartridge that they would develop for the rifle was the 30-03 in 1903, 30 caliber of 1903, 30-03. It was a rounded nose cartridge just like the 3040 Krag, but it did have the ballistic improvements that were desired for the new cartridge. Now in 1906, coming out with the 30-06 round, they would go into a Spitzer cartridge, which would be the pointed cartridge, the, the round that we all know and love today is the 30-06. Now by 1903, they had more or less landed on this design. You have the 1903 rifle with the thin profile magazine. The handguard was narrower than this. This is actually the 1905 revisions, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but you have the 30-03 the, uh, cartridge. You have you know, the, the Mauser style action, the dual locking lugs, the uh, receiver ring that allows for stripper clips. So you have a much improved, better rifle. Now Springfield starts getting commission on manufacturing these rifles of which the United States military wanted them to put out about 400 a month. They would also commission Rock Island Arsenal, RIA, to start building them as well, also in lesser numbers at about 125 per month, which both would actually stay on schedule. Now in 1905, they would come out with a couple further revisions one of the biggest ones is they would uh, put this hump on the rear of the handguard to protect the rear sight. One of the other ones was the bayonet. So the original 1903 used a rod style bayonet. As the name would suggest, it was just a very cylindrical looking sort of poker style bayonet which was actually prone to rattling around in its scabbard. It was very thin. It was easy to lose. 
uh, made a lot of noise and was not actually battle effective. By 1905, they came out with the M1905 model, which was more of a blade style bayonet. So then 1903 rifles coming out, old ones would be retrofitted and new ones would have this new barrel band with the traditional uh, bayonet lug on it for the new 1905 blade bayonet. But by 1905, this was the pattern that would come out. And then a year later in 1906, that's when they would develop the Spitzer cartridge variant of the 30-03, giving it the designation at 30-06, and the rest would be history on this design. Now in 1909, a couple subtle changes would be made to roll marks and things like that, but by and large, by 1905, you had this rifle with its cartridge ready to go. Now, as discussed, the 1903 took a very heavily influence from the Mauser action. It pretty much just ripped off the design. Everything down to the dual locking lugs, the rear receiver ring with the stripper clip, clip guide. Would this not get the attention of the Mauser company for obvious violations of their patents? Well, it did. And this is a point that's often somewhat discussed with some error, and I'm going to try and clear that up here. So in 1904, the Mauser firm would raise the possibility that the 1903 Springfield was in violation of its patents on the Mauser action and the stripper clip feeding system. It was found that the rifle itself did violate five of Mauser's patents and the stripper clip feeding system did violate two of Mauser's patents at seven patent violations in all. Now the United States military knowing it really didn't have a leg to stand on because this was an obvious ripoff of the design agreed outside of court to pay Mauser a royalty. They would pay 75 cents per rifle and 50 cents per 1,000 stripper clips that had been developed until $200,000 was paid off which was paid off by 1909. Now a lot of people do say that you know Springfield or the United States military was paying Mauser a royalty during World War One when both sides were shooting at each other this wasn't entirely true again by 1909 the the amount agreed upon had been paid off now what this did do was open up the door for another German firm they had seen the success of Mauser suing the United States government and getting them to agree to pay the money DWM went after the United States government as well but for the round now, in 1906, the U.S. military went with the Spitzer, which is a, a pointed cartridge, a pointed bullet, pointed projectile, in the 30-06 round. Now, DWM, Deutsche Waffen und Munitionsfabriken, did have the patent on the Spitzer round. They would then sue the United States government for a patent violation on the ammunition. Now, the United States did not necessarily believe that they were in violation of the patent. After all, they did start development of the round all the way with the Craig Jorgensen back in the 1890s prior to DWM's uh, you know, patent on the Spitzer cartridge. So the United States would say, no, we're not you know, going to pay you anything. DWM would then sue the United States, but World War I would intervene. Now, this, because this was an ongoing court case and the war would get in the way, this would sort of be shelved. On top of that, the United States would invoke the Property Custody Act, take custody of the patent, and go ahead and produce the Spitzer cartridges anyway. So during the war, there was no payments going from the United States government to either Mauser nor DWM. However, the funny thing is, in 1921, a few years after the conclusion of World War I, an international tribunal did find that the United States government was in violation of international treaties by enacting the Property Custody Act, therefore awarding or, or making the United States pay damages of $400,000 to DWM for enacting the PCA. Um, it's funny, though, because if the United States had just paid off, I think what DWM was looking for was about $250,000. If they had just paid it off to get DWM to go away, they wouldn't have had to enact the Property Custody Act, and they wouldn't have had to pay the $400,000. But hindsight's always 2020. But that's basically where that leaves off. Okay, so the 1903 has been developed, and it's ready for military usage. Now, there had not been a lot of production through Springfield. Rock Island, by this point, had stopped manufacturing them altogether. Now, in 1912 to 1914, there were a couple isolated incidents is where these would actually get its baptism by fire. In 1912, there was a Filipino pacification campaign, and then in 1914, there was a bunch of United States Marines were sent to Veracruz in order to protect a bunch of United States uh, citizens that were there during unrest in Veracruz at the time. So these had seen some isolated military service in that regard. Now, where this would start to see larger scale military use was in the First World War. By 1916, it had become clear that the United States was going to be roped into the war. So the United States Ordnance Department had ordered Springfield and Rock Island to go ahead and beef up their production. 
One of the problems was is there was a lot of demand for skilled labor during the 19 teens because of the wide scale industrialization in the United States at the time. So a lot of the skilled artisans at both places, Springfield and Rock Island, but specifically at Rock Island, who had been trained on the development and the production of this rifle had left on to go to other things. So Rock Island specifically was left with a workforce who didn't even know how to produce this rifle. So Rock Island is trying very desperately to scale up production for this rifle. Springfield is doing the same. There's not a lot of these rifles in reserve. The United States needs a ancillary rifle to help support United States troops in the First World War. Now, although these would stay as standard issue, the 1903 was adopted in 1903 as the standard issue replacement rifle, there would be more 1914 Enfield rifles used with the United States military in the First World War. Now, there were a few American firms. There was uh, Remington, Eddie, uh, Eddie Stone, and Winchester who had been producing for uh, government contract for England the P-14 Enfield rifle in 303. The United States military had two options. One is they could go ahead and take all those produced rifles, keep them in the United States in the 303 cartridge, use these in 30-06, making a logistical issue on two different calibers, and issuing them out quickly. Or they could take the then-in-stock P-14 or 1917 Enfield rifles, rechamber them to 30-06, issue them alongside the 1903 to supply the military, and that's what they chose to do. These are actually outproduced by the Eddie Stone and the Remington and the Winchester rifles, the 1917 model, by a factor of about three to one. And these would actually not be the primary used rifle in World War I, although this would be uh, observed or this would be uh, issued as the primary rifle, but it did not see primary service in the First World War. Now, in the interwar period, these would still be produced, but at greatly reduced numbers. Springfield would really take this as a time to innovate on the design. They would come out with a cavalry carbine variation. Uh, towards the end of World War I, there was a device called the Pedersen device built on the Springfield Mark I rifle, which had a cutout on the side of the receiver in order to attach a magazine using a 30 caliber pistol round in a semi-automatic fashion as a trench broom gun. That was designed and adopted way too late in World War I to make a difference, and unfortunately, a lot of those Pedersen devices were destroyed as a result. But a lot of innovation, a lot of tinkering with this design would go about. Now, in 1929, they would come out with the 1903A2. The 1903A2 is when they would incorporate the C-stock. And I think I just said 1903A2, I meant to say 1903A1. I'll talk about the A2. The A1 is in 1929, they incorporate the C-stock. This is the C-stock with the full swept pistol grip here. This is the standard S-stock, the straight stock that was usually seen on the 1903 rifles. This is in between a semi-pistol grip or the scant stock, which was mainly relegated as a replacement stock in the 1903 A3s and would also be produced for 1903 A4 production by Keystone, which I'll talk about in a minute. Okay, so now we move through the interwar period and we're getting into World War II, thus the transition from the 1903 to the 1903-83. Now, the story with this would actually start with Dunkirk. You have the mass evacuation of British troops back to England, and with that, they lose a tremendous amount of their war material. Now, they are deeply embroiled with a war against Hitler in Germany, and the United States has not yet been involved in the First World War. So Great Britain, looking very quickly to rearm, goes to the United States for aid for war material. Now, this would enact the Lend-Lease Program, in which case the United States would send a ton of equipment over to Great Britain, but also wanting to keep you know out of the war, so a lot of the material would be marked U.S. property for that very reason. It was just lent. It was not meant to be a, a declaration of war against Germany. So there was a lot of Thompson submachine guns, 1911s, tanks, machine guns, uh, different things that were sent over. Even Savage Arms Company in the United States would produce the number four Mark I pattern uh, Enfield rifle in 303 marked U.S. property. Now, one other company that would be solicited by Great Britain was Remington. Now, Remington did have a working relationship as they had taken part in the production of the P-14 rifles back during the World War I era. Uh, they wanted to solicit Remington to build them a 1903 pattern rifle, but in 303 British. Now, wanting the contract, Remington would go to the United States government and ask if they could have the rights to the manufacturing and the tooling of the 1903 pattern rifle. The United States agreed, and even Rock Island would give them 600 uh, stock blanks and some different parts and machinery so they could get up production. Now, this is happening in 1940. Just one year later, in 1941, the United States themselves would be pulled into a war after Pearl Harbor. 
So the United States is now involved in a war against Japan and is beginning to enter the Pacific theater of operations. The United States, unfortunately, is also very, very low on war equipment and war material. Now, in 1937, Springfield had begun adopting or at least working on this new design by John C. Garand, the M1 Garand rifle. So Springfield themselves had abandoned any type of production on the 1903. The United States government, who knew that just one year earlier, Remington had just started up production of the 1903 rifle, went to Remington and said, scrap, you know, production for British contracts. You're going to make these for us now. So... Remington would be producing the rifle in this configuration about 1940 to 1941. This configuration of rifle was still the configuration that United States Marines would enter into the Pacific Theater with the early stages, Guadalcanal, things like that. This is the pattern of rifle that would have been used. Now, one of the good things about getting away from arsenals and getting into private companies, Remington, who wanted to fulfill on the contract and get the rifles out, wanted to simplify and make the cost of production cheaper. This was to get more units into the government's hands and, of course, more money into Remington's pocket. So, with that aim in mind, uh, Remington would start to redesign the 1903. It would want to make it cheaper and easier to produce. First of all, a lot of these parts on the 1903 rifle are milled. You have a milled trigger guard, you have a milled floor plate here. They would move to a lot of stampings. So you have a stamped trigger guard on the 03A3 pattern, a stamped uh, magazine, box magazine floor plate. One of the other things was the rear sight. The rear sight base and rear sight assembly was all machined, very difficult and complicated to produce. Furthermore, it actually wasn't a very good battle sight. It was very complicated. It took a lot of training to use, and you're not going to have, you know, a need for this very finely tuned target sight. It's good for competition, but not so great for battle. So what Remington wanted to do was move this sight from the top of the barrel to the rear receiver ring, thus making the sight, sight closer to the eye of the shooter, giving a longer sight radius, giving better accuracy. Also, the, the sight itself could be mainly made of stamped parts and cheaper to produce. So they would come out with this configuration. They would dovetail the rear receiver ring, changing its, its uh, manufacturer slightly. They would outsource this rear sight assembly. They would come out with a new hand guard that would basically close off this entire rear section, adding a uh, hand guard ring here to the back. So that with the cheaper parts, um, they had actually simplified the butt plate as well in the front barrel band into stamped parts. Uh, this was actually cheaper and easier to produce. Now, the United States Ordnance Department did accept this as a legitimate modification change, and they would adopt this in 1942 as the 1903A3. Now, we talked about the 1903A1 as being when they would incorporate the C-stock in 1929. The 1903A2 was a very short production. It was a training implement that they had made for training on anti-tank rifles where they would produce the receiver with a reinforced action and no stock. That was the 1903A2, so it didn't really see, it wasn't substantial, it didn't see much service. But that would have to make this one the 1903A3. So by 1942, the M1 Garand is actually starting to fulfill all of its contracts for the Army, the Air Force, and the Navy. But the Marine Corps is still not, there's still not enough to outfit the Marine Corps, especially which were the main units fighting the Pacific Theater. Remington was churning these out. They were still actually, there was an overlap period between 41 and 42 where they were creating the original modified 1903 model and the 1903A3, but there wasn't enough to go around. So the United States Ordnance Department would go to high standard and ask if they could also get into production and get a contract for the 1903A3 rifle. High standard was making other military equipment. They were making barrels for the 1911A1. They were making all sorts of different stuff. So high standard said, look, uh, we can make the barrels for the 1903 A3 rifle, but can we subcontract Smith Corona, a typewriter company, to make the rest of the rifle? Uh, Smith Corona would actually make a prototype of 20 rifles off of the 1903 A3 pattern. They would submit them to the United States Ordnance Board. They did have the high standard barrels. The United States Ordnance Department would say, look, we're going to give the contract to uh, Smith Corona because they're making 90% of the rifle, and high standard will be considered a subcontractor on barrels. Uh, Smith Corona was actually in proximity, very close to the Remington Arms Factory, so the two of them would make parts and could ship them to each other and co-op on coming out with the 1903 A3 rifles. So from about 19... 
1942 to 1943, uh, Smith Corona is also producing the 1903 A3. So World War II produced 1903 A3s were only made by Remington and Smith Corona. And by about 19, late 1943, M1 Garands are fully in service everywhere. And these would start to be phased out in use. So mainly the 1903 A3s, they saw very, very limited production and use. They were used in military and combat, but were mainly used by MPs and back home as training implements. Okay, so by 1943, the 1903 A3 and 1903 rifles were pretty well tapering off in military combat. Now, the M1 Garand by this time was pretty much in the hands of every fighting man in both the PTO and the ETO. Uh, so the need for this to be in primary military service was no longer a requirement. Now, because of the 1903 technology, especially the rifles still being produced by Remington, the United States Ordnance Department had realized that the United States Army was in need of a DMR, a designated marksman's rifle or a sniper rifle, as many people call them. So, the United States Ordnance Department would go to Remington in 1943 and solicit them for a modified version of the 1903 A3 rifle that they are manufacturing, but getting retrofitted with a scope and could be folded into to the United States service through the military as their new rifle, the 1903 A4. Now, at first, Remington was very hesitant in this project. They really didn't want to undergo it. They had a really nice contract on the 1903 A4s, or on the 1903 A3s. They thought that 1903 A4 production would slow them down because now they need to get in with new subcontractors on the optics the mounts, the stocks, which are a little bit different. Now, the United States military agreed that they would take care of, of sourcing the mounts, the scopes, and the stocks if Remington could just continue cre uh, creating the actions, which they decided that they would do. So by 1943, Remington had gone into production of the 1903 A4 DMR, or sniper rifle. Now, for collectability, there's a couple things to note. What they would do is they would move the serial number off to the right-hand side of the front receiver ring here, and they would write the model designations on the left-hand side of the, rear of the front receiver ring here. That was so that both could be read underneath the scope. When the scope's mounted normally, serial and make would be right here on the top, but if you mount a scope, you can't read them. So they put them there so they could be read with the scope mount there. Another thing is these were all made by Remington. They were not made by Smith Corona or anybody else. So if you're looking at a 1903 A4 and it's marked Smith Corona, it is not an authentic rifle. Another thing they would do is because these were generally just 1903 rifles, the, they, the barrels would be cut for the front sight, although a front sight would never be added. So if there's any type of wear in the finish, it looks obvious that a front sight's ever been there. Not an authentic 1903 A4 rifle. The other thing is the United States government would help them source these stocks, first by Springfield and then Keystone would come in and help in production. You would have a relief cut here for the swept down bolt handle. The bolt handle had to be swept down so it would clear the scope. A standard 1903 A3 bolt handle could not clear the optics, so they had to sweep it down. Uh, can't really, I mean, you could look at a bunch of pictures and tell the difference to see if it's authentic or not, but of course they were all made by Remington and they'll be R stamped. The relief cuts are pretty obvious to tell a fake versus an original. You'll just have to look at a bunch of pictures, but both of these are original. Both of these are made by Keystone. Now you're gonna see either a K or an S stamped in the cutoff here. Uh, this is, both of these are made by Keystone. Both of these are marked with a K here in the cutoff channel. Um, scopes. Because Remington was not sourcing the scopes, they were sourced by the United States government. Now two scopes initially were approved for, uh, for uh, use on the 1903 A4. One was the Weaver 330C, and that's what this is, and that's what was used on virtually all of them in World War II. The other was a Lyman, Lyman Alaskan, uh, which was given the designation the M73. Now, the Lyman Alaskan was approved for usage on the rifle. However, they were only able to source about 200 units, which were put on early, like, uh, early production rifles. You see them in some uh, training manuals. And you see them in some photos and use, but by and large, 99% of the 1903 A4 is actually fielded the 330C scope. Now on the 330C scope, you'll see serial number with an electric pencil serial number here, and they would be marked M73B1 on the ID plate here. So you know you're looking at an authentic one. This is original to the rifle on this one, but this was, they notched the rear, uh, the mounting point for like a traditional scope mount. Uh, and got rid of the rings. I don't know why and the reticle on this one is blown, but this scope is original to this rifle This is using a replacement keystone stock, which is correct. It was just a field replacement um, Otherwise a, a correct rifle Now these would go on after World War II to be used in Korea 
in which case the M84 telescope would be added to it, which is what this is. So this is a post-war refurb, which would have gone on to Korea with the M84 scope added to it. But again, you have the offset serial number with the O3A3 markings on the left-hand side. It's got the correct uh, barrel, and all of them would be dated between 43 and 44. Uh, so you know those are your correct dates. Again, all made by Remington. So um, if we talk about what a DMR is, a designated marksman's rifle, it's not like the movies portray where a lone sniper is going and taking shots at a mile away. Uh, this is meant to be a force multiplier. It's to give a general rifleman a little bit of a tactical edge uh, to help, you know, to, to work the way you would sort of employ a machine gun, to give cover and support fire, to help different elements of your squad maneuver against the objective. This isn't, you know, like Jackson and Saving Private Ryan. Uh, that's kind of a false portrayal of how these would actually be employed, especially because you're talking about a small, you know, this is like a 22, like a rim fire scope, 2.5 power. You're not going to get a lot of precision out of this, just a little bit better, better accuracy out of this than you would like an M1 Garand. In fact, the 1903 uh a three production i mean these are normal production rifles put in uh just converted into sniper rifles so they didn't go it wasn't like the enfield tees where they went to holland and holland and got accurized and they you know handpicked the best performers they were just pulled out a normal 1903 a3 production from remington and just slapped on some off-the-shelf scopes to them and boom you have a dmr so not quite the press they normally get but that is basically the gist of the evolution of the 1903 to the 1903A4. All right, guys, that is all the time I have for you today on these. Thank you so much for stopping by and checking out this video. If you enjoyed, please let me know by hitting that like button. Please also consider subscribing to this channel and hit that bell notification button so you guys are aware when I am posting new content. I'm gonna leave you guys off with that. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports and WeBuyGuns.com in Westfield, Indiana. You are watching Marksman TV and I will see you next time.